Hello, magandang gabi sa atin lahat. Uh, welcome again to our show, Walang Plastikan. And today we have a very exciting topic uh, to talk about sachet waste, which is uh, not recyclable, which has no value, and which is the biggest problem of plastic pollution in our country. So what can we do with this? So shea base that is in our waters, in our places that we are using, that many people have to use uh, on a daily basis. Is there any chance to get it out of the waste stream? And uh, the good news is, yes, there is. And um, we have a very special guest today who will tell us what he and his company have done and is doing to upcycle sachet waste. Uh, our guest today is uh, Jonathan Cole. He heads the Sentinel Upcycling Technology. He's a project head of this and has 15 years in the plastic industry. And he's worked in different ways in sales, marketing, product development, organizational development, operations management. So he really knows the nuts and bolts of working with plastic. And not only does he have the experience, he also has the knowledge because he has a degree of plastic engineering from British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. So he really studied it. And he also studied management information systems in Ateneo. And so I think he really has a lot to say today on how we can give plastic waste a new life. Uh, so Jonathan, uh, thank you so much for joining. Thank um, you. Thank here you. It is. <laughs> thank you. I like the Pink Panther uh, <laughs> theme in your intro. That's very nice. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so we have only 30 minutes, so let's just stick into it. Um, right, uh, yourself. But before we talk about upcycling, it would be good to, to get to know you a little bit. So would you uh, describe yourself maybe three things that, that are important to know about you? <laughs> uh, three things. I'm, uh, I'm very passionate. Uh, I would like to think I'm uh, a good problem solver. And I like systems. I like creating <laughs> systems. Wow, yeah, you're an engineer, so probably it really fits into uh, how you have evolved. And in this journey, uh, would you like to share a few important milestones in, in your life that have, have impacted you in, in moving forward in your life? Well, personally, I, as, I, as I look back, you know, a lot of, a lot of people uh, underestimate the importance of uh, the luck, L-U-C-K. I think <laughs> I, I consider myself very blessed, very lucky to be uh, uh, born uh, in, in a family of, of means and to be given the opportunity to uh, get a good education and the nice upbringing and the discipline. And um, I, I've, ever since I was young, uh, I was I, I lived in the factory, and so this this thing about manufacturing and dealing with systems and solving problems, this is something that uh, I was exposed to at a very very uh, young age. So you know a lot of the uh, Filipino Chinese uh, people, they uh, usually have uh, shop houses. So we were no different. So we lived where we worked. Uh, so in our case, we're in manufacturing. So early on, we lived where the factory was. And I think that's very important. Um, the second thing is uh, that the, the, you mentioned I, I studied plastics engineering in Vancouver. This was purely by accident. Uh, sometimes uh, God will, uh, will bring people in your life and say some things. And it will, it will put your life in a different direction. And uh, that's how I found the plastics engineering course in, in Vancouver wow. you know, through a family friend. And we were just having dinner and said, oh, you're in plastics. There's a course and you should take it. And uh, I did. And 
it was very very good wow wow that is really uh to see that really the how things come together to put you on a trajectory that that makes a big difference and makes you the person uh, of who you are and now you got into this upcycling initiative uh, yes. what is the story behind it how did you got into into that idea or Okay. Well, I have to give uh, I have to give credit uh, where credit is due. Um, the the first group uh, that we worked with is a brand owner, a local. Uh, well, they're a global brand. Uh, they're they're a global company. Sorry, Mondelez. They're the brand owner of Tang Juice, and uh, their uh, execution partner. Uh, shout out to uh, Mom Rachel of uh, Global Vision. <laughs> um, for finding us, and uh, the story was uh, they were already uh, supposed to partner with uh, another group, but uh, for some reason it did not push through, and they were in a bind. And uh, they gave uh, who is now uh, the head of uh, sales for Sentinel Upcycling, uh, my colleague, uh, a call, and uh, uh, they were looking for a school furniture, which we already make. And uh, they asked us if we could uh, make it out of sachet. And uh, as uh, being an engineer, my answer is always, we will see. And uh, <laughs> we were quite fortunate that we were, th the team and I were able to make it happen. And uh, they ordered a substantial amount. And a few years later, uh, Nestle, uh, through their uh, bare brand, Milk, uh, wanted to do a similar project. And that became the Tang Recyclas uh, project, which is still ongoing. And around this time, uh, the plastic industry was was making uh, was getting a lot of negative press because of the ocean plastic and all of that. Mm -hmm. And um, we've always known that uh, plastic pollution is a waste management problem. And uh, since we have this, uh, we've been recycling for 35, 40 years already. And so we thought, okay, well, we figured out how to do it with, with the chairs, the school chairs. Uh, why don't we commercialize it and uh, make more products out of it? Because we believe, I personally believe, um, you know, paying someone to do something is the best way to change their behavior. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, and, and that's how Sentinel Upcycling Technologies uh, came to be. So the recycling part we've been doing for so long. The upcycling part is the new thing uh, because sachets, as you mentioned, used to have uh, zero value. Yeah, in fact, you have to pay people to take it away. So, yeah, that's that's kind of like the the two minute uh, backstory. Yeah. So wow! Wow! Well, so it was also another way that it was given to you uh, to 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 use your skills to to develop it, and I can still remember the. The times when I was still living in the Philippines, I went to, to your factory and, and I saw all the wonderful products that you have created and, and you're thinking, wow, they were made out of trash. Unbelievable. Yes. <laughs> it's really uh, uh, very yes. high quality it's, material. <laughs> it still amazes me that it, it worked. <laughs> uh, we're continuously improving it. Uh, we would like to you know come up with better formulations and uh, more products and uh, be able to just use a lot more of the the different sachets that are available out there yeah yeah, yeah. of course yeah i don't want you to share your industry secret to us but i think people will think they look at the sachets and then if they would look in your catalog and they will mm. see the wonderful products they would think well how are, how is how are they doing this how can uh, how can that work? You know, it's incredible. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I can I, I can share with you the the general idea. And so, um, sachets, just like uh, most of the plastics we encounter, are what you call thermoplastics. So what that is is that um, all plastic starts out as uh, some sort of uh, solid, or in some cases, liquid. And then, if in, in the case of uh, sachets, it's it's a solid. You heat it up, and it softens, then it melts. And the thing that makes it thermoplastic and not thermoset is that when you heat it up, it cools down. A thermoset, when you heat it up again, you can't do it. It won't melt anymore. You have to process it or recycle it in another way. But thermoset, you can heat and form 
uh, many, many, many times. Uh, and um, what we do with the sachets is that exactly that. No, we, we, we grind it, uh, we shred it, and then um, we melt it. And then the liquid we uh, inject into a mold. And then we cool the mold down. We open the mold and uh, take out the product. No, we, we do it. I, I, I guess, you know, many, many people uh, do this. Many organizations do this. Uh, what makes ours different is that we do it in a large scale. So, for example, the school chairs I was mentioning about, on one line, we're able to make 800 sets a day. Wow. So, wow. That, that, yeah, that, so you know, so that, that's, that's uh, what makes us different. Uh, because the technology is pretty simple, right? Mm -hmm. So again, as I mentioned, you grind, you melt, you inject, you cool down, you open the mold. Um, but again, to to get any sort uh, get any sort of impact out of it, uh, in terms of reducing waste, uh, you really have to do it in a mass production mass production scale. That makes a lot of sense because there's also a lot of sachet waste out of it so if you want make yes. a different uh, you probably need to make some scales but i can imagine it was also not easy to to start this kind of line of of, of business and would you like to share some of the challenges that you had to overcome to get there <laughs> the the biggest challenge is the the technological challenge because uh at the start um because uh, our equipment is is quite expensive, and the molds we use are quite expensive, and so the cost of making a mistake is also quite expensive. And uh, uh, you know, our experience certainly certainly uh, makes it a lot uh, easier, but but still, it's a technical uh, hurdle, at the, especially early on. Um, the second challenge is the just sourcing post consumer waste, uh, because as you know, in the Philippines, we practice what is called single stream waste management. And so every, that what that means for, for the viewers is everything goes in one bin and you, you just deal with it on an industrial scale. But the way we deal with it in the Philippines is, you know, we sort what we can, but most of it goes to the landfill or, or the, the dump site. And that is simply not uh, sustainable. Um, the third thing is because we have made a conscious decision to... Uh, work with communities and uh, post-consumer waste as opposed to, you know, factory waste. The post-consumer waste, uh, it's very difficult or it's very challenging to work with so many communities because, you know, you have different uh, uh, mindsets, you have different political situations, uh, you have different resource limitations. Um, sachet waste is... Uh, a problem of the class C, the lower classes in, in society. So, you know, if you're hungry, it's very difficult to get them to listen on how, you know, why, why would I have to prioritize waste when I have to find the food to put on the table? So that's the third challenge. And uh, the fourth challenge is the market. Uh, we, we, we don't make, uh, our business model is that we don't make any, uh, well, we, we only make money when we sell the product. And so it, you, you, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, stigma to uh, products made out of waste. Um, they think it should be cheaper. They think the quality is inferior. And uh, to a certain extent, that, that has merit. But that's where the engineering part comes in. Uh, because you have to make it so that um, they, the, the consumer gets what they want. And the environmental benefit, the societal benefit, uh, the community benefit is an add-on. Um, because if, if they have to sacrifice the usability or the quality, then you're kind of just creating more waste. Because yeah, if it will be yeah. too then then it defeats the purpose, right? And probably it is, um, I could imagine that from the production cost, it's more ex expensive because making the chairs out of virgin plastic, you just make the resin you just order the resin you melt it uh, and press it into the chairs but if you have That's to right. uh, do it from uh, post-consumer waste there are so many processes by preparing the post-consumer waste so that you can use it as a resin so actually the product and the production costs are probably much much higher 
that that's that's right and and if if, if i may add uh that is why we are advocating uh for sorting at source and keeping it sorted throughout the supply chain you know you know peter it's uh all of the pieces are there right the mrfs in the barangays the the waste haulers um the junk shops the recyclers and the manufacturers they're all there uh it just needs to be more cohesive and i think that's that's really the the root of the problem or and and its solution we have to work together this is the most important thing yeah, yeah. well i think that is a very interesting approach to work uh with uh with communities because you could also just get from the the factory defects from the uh from the factory to have the same material so to yes. speak <laughs> yes absolutely but, absolutely uh so this is actually a a more expensive way and this is where kind of like the advocacy that uh we are doing um plays a huge part because that that desire to change the mindset and the behavior of of the consumer that you know the 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 store the, the visual I to always is you know if I throw my mobile phone in the waste bin or in the floor by instinct people will pick it up and if you think about it they do that because they know the mobile phone has value and in a nutshell that's how we want people to see waste that it is something of value because it is. We've been in the plastic industry for 56 years already. My grandfather started it in 1964. So we've been recycling for as long as we've been making plastic products, right? So when we first found out about this, uh, personally, um, I first found out about the ocean plastic waste uh, from uh, Cleaner Oceans uh, Project founder, Anna Barona. <laughs> and okay. to me, it was like, why is this a problem? We, we can make stuff out of this. So then it becomes, oh, the problem is it's mixed waste. Oh, the problem is logistics. Oh, the problem is market. And so fundamentally, it's it's valuable. But you have mm -hmm. to create an environment where you can extract the most value out of it. And that is that is the challenge now. Yeah, I, I like that because that is exactly uh, the same uh, philosophy that Plastic Bank is applying as well. And I think that... And, and that is really true. The plastic, uh, the value of the plastic needs to be revealed. So nobody will throw it away. It won't become trash. It will go into a circular economy. And I think your upcycling model is a very powerful um, example of how a circular economy can work in, in, in the Philippines and how people can can be part of it. Yeah, it is, it is working. Uh, it, it is working. We're very happy. One of the things that this uh, pandemic has shown us is that uh, there are many, many households and small businesses uh, that are are looking for products like this, and uh, and it, it it always makes me so happy that you know even though they order a few because that's the only thing they need, but mm. you know their neighbors will see it and they'll ask, and that's really how things grow, and and we need this grassroots movement of of people influencing other people. And I think if, mm. if more enough people uh, uh, buy into this circular economy mindset, uh, we will solve the problem. I have mm -hmm. no doubt about it. Okay. And uh, what is your your vision for the future? If you, what do you think, what would you like to see happening in the next five years or so with uh, your uh, with wow. us upcycling <laughs> so many things um i would like to see a better material recovery facility in every barangay i would like to see uh and before that i would like to see a uh more organized uh waste management system in the household in the offices in the schools um we have this uh a framework that, that we communicate to people called uh, recycler ready or manufacturer uh, ready uh, recyclables. What that means is, you know, going to the, the junk shops and going to the manufacturers and the recyclers and asking them, what condition should I bring this plastic or this metal or this paper uh, waste to you? 
so that you will pay me the best price. And then working backwards and setting it up so that you can deliver those things to them. So you get the highest price and the manufacturer, the recycler, and the junk shop can make use of it immediately. Um, and uh, right now, the, the, the old way of just mixing everything is not sustainable. So in the next five years, I would like to see people sorting waste at home. And I would like to see uh, the kariton, uh, you, you, the, the, the nangangalakal in Tagalog, mm -hmm. the, the kariton uh, people, the waste pickers, you know, segregate, keeping it segregated, bringing it to the MRF, putting it in the bin, again, keeping it segregated, and the junk shops and the recyclers picking it up aggregating it in their in their facilities and then selling it to manufacturers like us so imagine there's no uh, there, there, there's no cleaning notice in, in that you clean it at the house and then mm -hmm. you just keep it clean throughout the supply chain yeah, yeah. so and it's, it's the lowest possible cost in my opinion because you don't have industrial cleaning and all of that there's no weight improper wastewater. Because if you clean it at home, it's part of the waste network, uh, wastewater network, the sewer system. It goes to a proper treatment plant, you know. Yeah. So you don't end up discharging it on the esteros and the canals. That's what I want to see in the next five years. Yeah, wonderful. And I think that uh, very much is actually what I also, uh, our hearts and minds are aligned on that. I think if 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 that would be achieved and and everybody were doing that, and we have a system for that, then it would be a much, uh, it, will, it will solve probably 90% of the ocean plastic from, from the Philippines. And then we have um, here or some in the comments, uh, Colleen Davila Palaganas, who is uh, our chairperson from Sustainable TV, Philippine TV. Thank you, Colleen, for watching. And here she, um, she has a number of, uh, points. Uh, so she already taking notes like we need an organized waste management system at home, office and schools. We need yep. better material recovery facilities. Exactly. And then her question would be what kind of ecosystem or value change, what incentives can make people shift their habits or how can we change the habits um, at home and like like for example what you said with the uh, cleaning the waste at home like if you do your dishes just uh, before you throw the water away you just take your your plastic waste and clean it you know and so yeah. you don't even have extra water you know you just do it while you clean your dishes and so how can we motivate people just to do s simple <laughs> steps like that and maybe just take three minutes a day you know i think it's uh there are several it it, it depends i think on on the well, we've been working with a lot of uh, communities. So there are several things, okay? If, if it's in the lower uh, classes of, of society, of course, uh, the financial uh, incentive is a big, uh, is a big uh, behavior driver. If it's the more affluent uh, middle class to upper class subdivisions, it's the community. I, I think the fact that there's a place that you go and you meet your neighbor and you share this experience. Um, yeah, Cleaner Oceans does this drop the plastic events. And, and, when, and whenever I visit, it's really the communities that say they're, they're saying hi, they get to see each other, they get to support each other, they get to share their experiences. I, I think it's, it, that's, uh, those are the two things. Um, and of course, uh, the biggest driver in my opinion is they have to see that their effort is actually making a difference. So for us, it's built in to because we make product and they see the chair, they see the crates, they see the furniture, they see the pallets. And, and so it excites them. It's like, oh my God, this is what you can do from my waste? Yes, it is. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, it, yeah. and, and it's, it, it's something that, that encourages them, you know? Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's, that's the incentive system. There's the monetary and then there's the psychological community aspect of it. 
Yeah. It's like you could see three pictures. You see the beach full of trash. You, do, you see the big dump site, the big mountain of trash with smoke and blah, blah. And then you see the product and then you can say, which of the three do you want? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and Absolutely. It's actually, the answer is so clear, you know, if you just think it in your mind. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why I have I have no doubt, Peter, that that with with effort and time, uh, of course, we still have to reduce plastic consumption and uh, reduce, reuse, recycle all of these things. But the management portion uh, is key. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that uh, we have to, since we are in this situation of a single stream waste management system, it will take time, and everyone must help, and yeah, yeah. because everyone can do something. Mm -hmm. Right, and so and so, everyone must do something, mm -hmm. and it's it's very beautiful once it's once it starts working. And I've seen it in some small way in some communities. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah. Actually, we also doing that even with the church. You know, people come together. They bring their trash to the church on Sunday and. And, and I think it, the awareness is raising and is growing. You know, if you think we have the Republic Act 9003 already for 20 years, and, and so though it should have been already implemented for a long time, but I think now is the time where, where we see it's, it's becoming more mainstream, so to speak. And, um, Absolutely. Yes, uh, for sure. Um, I think the public has paid more attention to it. Um, but there are still missing pieces uh, because again, um, you know, I visited this this place in Japan. It's called Kamikatsu. They're called a zero waste town. Okay. Uh, their their waste segregation categories is around forty four. Wow. <laughs> forty four. And I was asking the director, the waste management director, why forty four, and her her answer is actually the the mindset that it, my eureka moment in this upcycling journey is is that because she said well that's what our buyers want that's it mm -hmm. so so whatever they can monetize they will sort it in that way and i think for the longest time people have been asked to be so sorting and all these things but you know when they see it all just going in in the same truck then it kind of demoralizes them. And so it's oh, really yeah. about an ecosystem. You have to build an ecosystem of positive reinforcement uh, mm -hmm. so that more people will, will do it, not just because, you know, for altruistic reason, but because th this is what the environment I'm in calls for. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it takes time because, you know, you're dealing with communities. But I think it can be done. And yeah, it's, yeah. it is and being done. And it shows it also like your upcycling initiative shows it can also become an economically viable business as well. You know, it, it, it is something that you can generate products out of it that, that have a market that have a that are high quality uh, as well. And I think uh, in that way you have a closed you have a closed loop. And and I think if there are buyers like you. Uh, to take the, the material, you know, uh, I think, and people get some incentives for it, they will yes. segregate it, you know, like what you said, it's a value, it becomes a value chain in, yes. in, the, in the literal sense, so to speak. Yes, it is, it is. One person's trash is another person's treasure, but we just need to bring it to someone like us to turn it into that treasure. And then, yeah. we'll, you know, your sachet will bring it back to you as like a hanger or like a crate or like a tray. Or like a, a tumbler of some sort. <laughs> so that's that's circular economy right there. Wow, wow, that's wonderful, uh, Jonathan. I really, I think our watchers uh, were able to to learn a lot. We thank you for the questions for the people and for you to share. And and um, my personal wish to you is all the best and prayers that this upcycling business will will really. Uh, grow and you will be able to uh, process thousands of tons of waste and put them into new products uh, and um, and uh, generate uh, social and environmental and economic in impact through through your work so 
Thank you thank so you. much, Jonathan. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Thank you, thank you to the organizers of uh, the show and to Sustainable PH. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, dear people, uh, thank you so much. Maraming salamat to to be with us today, and hope you enjoyed the the show. Next week is again Dan Diaz with Get It Done, and I'm with you again in two weeks when I, I will talk about plastic pollution and and health. Uh, well, that's also an interesting topic. So be again with us, and all of you have a great weekend and a nice evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Oh.